and it says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, everyone say today. If you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end while it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. This journey from Egypt through the Red Sea to Sinai to the Promised Land serves as a picture of your and my individual Christian walk and life and the path that God is wanting to lead us on. And so that story serves as types and shadows of what can be a spiritual reality. And there's a huge warning here and so we're going to pick up with that. Let's stop and pray, though. Let's ask God to bless our time in his word. Father, thank you so much. We open our hearts to you. And Jesus, we're just thankful that you were pierced on the cross for our sins, that you took the debt of humanity. We're thankful for life and the promises of, of eternal life, of a resurrected body, of being able to stand with you and not feeling any shame, that when we first see you, we will be filled with such a boldness knowing you have taken away everything that once separated us from you, God. Thank you, Jesus. What a mighty Savior. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here who does not yet know you as Savior, that you would rock their stinking worlds today in the very best way possible, that they would come to know and believe that you, Jesus Christ, are the risen, living God, that you alone can change their life. Nothing else really can change their life but you, Lord. You're the one. Lord, we open our hearts up to your word and we just pray that you would speak deep things to us, cut into us and get down into us, Lord. Get into the guts of our spirit and expose and convict and, and warm and heal and encourage. You know each heart here and you love each person with the same amount of love and it's a ferocious, intense love. And Lord, help us to do our job by simply opening up the heart and responding to what you got to say. Holy Spirit, do a great work in our midst. Father, we pray these things in the name of Jesus, and we say together as a family, amen. So we left off last week looking at how the Israelites could not enter into God's promised land of rest because of their unbelief in God's promises and how the Holy Spirit has warned us don't follow in their footsteps. Today, we're going to look at how to enter into God's rest. And guys, no joke, Hebrews chapter 4, along with another passage of scripture, has changed and affected my Christian life more than any other passages in the entire Bible. So I'm really stoked to teach it. And I've been praying all week that God's spirit would impact you in a really, really profound way today. So if you're ready, would you say, let's do it? Verse 1, chapter 4. Therefore, therefore, based on everything that was said in chapter 3, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. It says a promise remains. It means it still stands for us. And then it says, let us fear. And so God's saying, I want you to have a healthy fear that you could actually miss out on all that I got for you. 
It says in verse 1, let us fear lest any of you. Everyone say me. This message is not for the person sitting next to you. It's not for the person you wish was at church. It's for you, bro. It's for you, sister. It's for me too. It's us personally. Because guys, what you do with God's promises determines your whole life. Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. God has given so many promises for us to stand on. The problem is when we start expecting things from God he never promised. When we're not reading the word and and we get bitter and disappointed with God because he doesn't do what we wish he did and there's all these unmet expectations between us towards God because we're hoping in things he never promised. But when you dig into what his promises actually are, that's when you get into this zone and just a sweet spot in life. Verse two, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. The Israelites heard the message, but God's promises when proposed were not mixed with hearts of faith. You see, you have to have the one plus the other to get the magic going on. God's promises plus a heart of faith, that's when the sparks start to connect and the fireworks go off. And by looking at the Israelites as our example, After they were saved and delivered from Egypt, there were two different paths of life that could be taken. The first path was the wilderness with its aimless wanderings and unbelief, its constant complaining, wishing I had a better life. It's dry there, spiritually, relationally. And it's a life excluded from the promised land because of a lack of faith in God. The second path is the land of promise with rest and provision, full of purpose and you got direction instead of desert wanderings going around in circles. You got satisfaction and contentment instead of constantly longing for something better. And it means having victory over every enemy instead of experiencing defeat after defeat. Friends, these are the two examples of what our Christian life will ultimately and inescapably be. If there was another path, he would have included it. There's two paths after salvation, wilderness or the land of promise. Sure, the one life knows Jesus as savior and deliverer, that he is the one who forgives sin, but the other life goes farther and knows Jesus as the king of heaven, knowing him as the one who has the power to give and appropriate an endless life into our spirits who leads us on into a promised and super abundant life. Guys, the aim of this passage is to warn us, don't be satisfied with wilderness Christianity and to encourage us on towards God's promised life of rest. Guys, remember that Canaan, which was the land they were to enter, doesn't represent heaven because there's no giants or battles that we'll be having in heaven. Canaan represents conquest and the conquering of every spiritual obstacle that keeps us living in mediocrity, whether the obstacle is within our hearts and minds or if it's something exterior that every time we're faced with it, we capitulate and shrink back. The land was waiting for them. The rest was provided. But unbelief closed the door. That's the warning to us. Look at verses 3 through 5 now. For we who have believed do enter that rest. As he has said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, 
for he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. Everyone say seventh day. It says God rested on the seventh day from all his works, and again in this place they shall not enter my rest. Now this can kind of seem confusing, but simply this is describing where the rest comes from and what the rest actually is. Because you and I could have a back and forth conversation of what rest could be and come up with a lot of great things, but God has something specific in mind. When he mentions the seventh day, he's talking about the seventh day of creation. Remember, for six days, God created the heavens and the earth and the plants and the animals and humans. And then after six days, on the seventh day, he rested. So, the rest we're talking about here is a rest that comes from within God himself. It is his own personal rest that he is enjoying in his heart and in his mind. Doesn't that sound awesome? Notice in verses 3 and 5 the phrase, they shall not enter my rest. And if you go back to chapter 3, this statement has been shared a total of four times now. Four times God says, there's a line. And there comes a point where you're you're not going to enter into my rest. Why is God saying this? It's not because he's really angry. It's because he wants to point out how evil unbelief really is. And it's because he really doesn't want you to miss out. He doesn't want you to miss out because he loves you. He's warning you. Come in, come in. It's available to you. Verses 6 through 8 Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, again he designates a certain day, saying in King David, today, everyone say today. After such a long time, as it has been said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. So the author brings in two figures now, Joshua and King David. Joshua was the one who actually led the people into the land. David was Israel's greatest king. The point, the point is that David came 400 years after Joshua. So if Joshua had really led the people into the fulfillment of God's rest, then why 400 years later would David be saying people can still enter into God's rest? So the point is just saying like, no, like the, it wasn't fulfilled then, it's still available. So it's like, when is God's rest available? Well, we see in verse seven, twice, the word today appears. Today, today. And remember, last week in chapter three, the word today appeared three times. So five times in these two chapters, the Holy Spirit reminds you that God is way more concerned about your today than your tomorrow. That if you're constantly thinking about tomorrow, you're gonna miss out on what tomorrow holds for you. The only way to get to tomorrow is to focus on your today and to walk with him today. God only asks one single thing of you on a daily basis. You might think God has laid all these trips on you and you gotta do so much. No, he hasn't at all. He asks one thing of you every single day and that is to have a habit of faith. Every day, today, today, he asks you to believe in him, to believe in his son, and to believe in the promises laid out in the word of God. Now, in thinking about the Israelites as they're wandering in the desert for all these years, you know, there came a time when they eventually turned towards the direction of the promised land and they began marching towards it. But I want you to catch something. They only did that with Joshua leading their way. You see, you and I also need a leader to lead us in. In the story, Moses and Joshua become types of the work of Jesus in our life. Moses and Joshua represent the two 
fold work of Christ's salvation. You see, Moses delivered the people and brought them out, but Joshua finished the work and brought them in. Let Jesus become your Joshua. Do you understand? Let him lead you into what God has promised you. And we see how he leads us by his life and his teachings. We follow him, we follow his doctrine, and he leads the way. Guys, the promised land, it was just a shadow and a lesson to the reality of what God offers you, not tomorrow, today. He offers us so much today. And look at God's offer and promise to you in verse 9 now. It says, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. I want you to notice the word rest. In the Greek, this is the word Sabbath. You might have a translation that says Sabbath rest. There remains therefore a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And, and dudes, this is a game changer. I mean, this opens up a world of understanding into this passage and what God's really talking about. You guys are familiar with the Sabbath, probably, how, you know, it comes from God worked for six days and he, he took the seventh day off and then he created a week and you work and, and you take a day off and it's good to have that literal day off. We see it was mandated in the law that God knew people need a, a reset button and you need to take a day off. You need to enjoy Labor Day tomorrow, you know, and just kind of get away with family and all. It's like if you work seven days a week, you will lose your family, you know. And so, yes, it's good to, to apply this practically for sure. But this is telling us right here that there was a deeper meaning to what the Sabbath really was all along. Here it's being described as God's own personal rest that he enjoys, and he's inviting us into being soaked in it. Verse 10 says, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Now we're going to slow down for a little bit. We're going to camp out in this verse for a while. Uh, re read verses 9 and 10 again. Therefore, a Sabbath rest remains for the people of God. For he who has entered God's rest has himself also ceased from his works, our works, as God ceased from his. Now, although God's work of creation was finished on the seventh day, his greater work was not yet finished. You see, God's greatest accomplishment was not the creation. The greatest achievement of God was to save and redeem and transform rebellious and lost humanity. And until he accomplished this, he wouldn't be at rest concerning humanity. I mean, the proof is, look at all the work Jesus did for 33 years. He was working, working, not resting. Working to save us. And as Jesus went, and as he willingly was pierced for our transgressions and was crushed for our sins, as he absorbed the debt and penalty of mankind like a sponge into his own body, on the cross, when his work was done, he cries out triumphantly, it is finished. It's done. To Tetelestai. Everything that needed to be done is now finished. Boom, shakalaka, Satan. Kick you in your head. You're done. You know? You're done. And then he rises again. He ascends back into heaven. And verse 10 Verse 10 is saying, when he did that, he ceased from his work and has now entered into rest. Jesus is sitting down in heaven because his work of saving us is finished. Do you know what God's doing right now? As he looks at you, do you know what he thinks? Right now, God is not working or panicking or freaking out in order that you might be redeemed. God himself 
Our Father in heaven is resting because Jesus finished his mission of providing salvation to humanity. The deal is, he's calling you to join him in resting in the perfect work of Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 2 verse 16 says, a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. Titus chapter three, it says verse 15, it's really verse five, sorry for that. It says, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. I can say a big fat amen to that, can you? Not by my work, by his mercy, he saved us. Because of what Jesus has done for you, God is resting right now in regards to your righteous, perfect standing before him. God is not requiring anything more from you than your just having a simple trust in Jesus Christ. Can you do that today? That's the work of faith. That's the labor God has called you to. And if you have entered into his rest, it means you've completely stopped trying to get to heaven on your own. It also means you've stopped trying to please God by your works. You've completely been crucified to a mindset that says, I will get blessings if I earn my paycheck. Now, though that works that way in the world, you work hard, you get a paycheck, God says, that's not how I work in my kingdom. You see, as long as you're working and doing things to be accepted by God, as long as you think you gotta do something, because if you do it, then you think you can be more confident before God to ask him to bless you, if you have that mindset, you will never enter his rest. Your life will be filled with turmoil and chaos and your heart will churn over and over in itself and you will have a lack of rest because you can't earn it. You're not that cool. You're not that great. You see, when we get to heaven, if we could even contribute 1% to salvation, we'd want a little pat on the back for ourselves. But God says, no flesh will boast in my presence. When you get to heaven, you will be utterly in awe of the fact that your salvation was the 100% work of Jesus Christ alone. Amen? That's how great of a savior he is. It almost is too good to be true because his love is greater than our capacity for love. So guys, your rest is determined on entering into what God himself is resting in. He's not interested in what you've done. He's not interested in how you've performed. He's interested in you discovering what Jesus has done. He wants you to rest in that just as he is resting in that. Amen? Something else I want you to notice in verse 10 is the word works. It says, he who has entered God's rest has himself also ceased from his own works. Now this word work is speaking about carnal striving works. Okay, that's the context. Striving to accomplish things. Now, when God entered into his rest after the creation, it's not like he just stopped all activity. He was still active, and just think of all the works he accomplished in the Old Testament, although he had entered into rest. And when Jesus entered his rest in heaven, it doesn't mean he got lazy and becomes this couch potato. Like, you get to heaven, Jesus isn't gonna be like lay, sprawled out on a couch with like potato chip crumbs on his shirt, you know? <laughs> like, I haven't been doing anything for the last 2,000 years. Like, I'm glad you guys showed up to the party. He's still working and ministering and doing things. So this means something great for us. This means something so important, we can't miss this. God's rest 
is not the posture of your body. Like you're in a hammock, like, you're like, that sounds good. Like, that's great after a hard day's work. But that's not what it's about. God's rest, it's about the state of being of your heart. It's not a state of of passive, selfish enjoyment. It doesn't lead to a negligence of the responsibilities of life. Entering God's rest is to cease from striving. It's to die to self because the flesh is always looking to prove how good it is. The flesh is always seeking to, to do something to get recognized, to get a pat on the back, to show off its strength, to, to show other people, I do this better than y'all. I want people to recognize it. And it's so selfish, it will even try to do the works of God in the power of the flesh rather than in the power of the spirit. So my friend, think about this. What areas of your life are you trying too hard in? What are you trying too hard? Is it at work? Is it parenting? Is it, is it the way you look? What are you trying too hard in? God says, stop it. Stop it. Because you're heading towards a wilderness. Stop and turn around. Because when you enter into his rest, God inside you will be the one doing the work through you instead of you trying to do it in your own power, which only leads to burnout. And you're aggravated, and you come home, and you're just ticked at the world, you know, and you take it out on everyone in your house, and that's not what God has. And you know, if there's one person who entered into God's rest and worked and accomplished more than any other Christian, it was the Apostle Paul. And he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and 10, I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than all of them, though it was not I but the grace of God that was in me. He says, I, I'm the least qualified to do this apostle thing. And yet I accomplished more than all the apostles. He traveled more, he suffered more, he endured more. He wrote half the New Testament. You see, God's grace works hard and it gets more accomplished in rest than what you can do all by yourself in striving and trying to force something to happen. You see, when you're working in God's rest, the state of your heart is full of peace and stillness. I want you to understand something. Don't be naive to the fact that most people who have accomplished a lot of stuff in life have done it in turmoil and unrest and they're in, in a spirit of competition and they're striving and they're cutting corners and they're full of anxiety and worry. God's rest eliminates all that, gives you a good night's sleep and still helps you outdo yourself in whatever you could do on your own. You see, when you're striving, you stay up till four in the morning to do it, and when you're in God's rest, you get a good night's sleep and you still get more stuff done. And God's like, that's what I'm talking about. That's the land of blessing, you see. It's a good land. It's a land of provision. I'll hook you up. And you know, most men who have become multimillionaires and they have these huge mansions, not all of them, but most of them live in that mansion all by themselves because they burn their family in order to get it so they're gonna die a lonely, pathetic, rich man. Not having anyone to love and not having anyone loving them. So remember this. When you are resting in God, a lot gets accomplished. You bear lots of fruit. And more gets done in peace of, in your heart than everything you could do through the flesh all by yourself. This is speaking to someone in your business or whatever you're trying to do. God is saying, stop it. Stop working so hard. Give yourself to things that I want you to give yourself to. Prayer, your wife, your husband, your kids, serving. And he says, I'll hook you up. Oh, wait, wait, you, you don't, chapter three, you don't believe? Oh, wait a second, you don't believe that? 
Well, then he's warning us of wilderness Christianity. So what does this look like, you know, like practically? Day by day as we're living our life, because this is a lot of thick doctrine, but it's like when you're at work, or when you're at school, or, or when you have screaming toddlers and 15 people are staring at you, or like when, when you have real problems that need real solutions. Well, remember, it's not ceasing from all activity or not having any obstacles come your way, but it's resting all the way through it. It's not ignoring or sleeping through a problem. It's not turning to something so you escape reality. It's just that the condition of your heart is at complete rest as you're working and facing the problem. It's when you say, it's not me, it's Christ in me. You walk through the door and enter the rest. And think of what Jesus sees and thinks and feels right now. He's up in heaven. His work is done. Think of what he feels. Think of his patience and his peace. That's what he's inviting you into. A deep, deep restfulness and a holy stillness in the heart in the midst of lots of outward activity. That's this sweet spot that we're talking about. God's own personal rest. Do you need that today? Do you need that today? Do you want that today? Then it's yours by faith and by faith alone. And as you enter into the finished work of Christ, he becomes your Joshua and he leads you into a better land, a better life, always marching forward into better things. And just like the Israelites, all entering means a coming out from the place we were in before. You gotta get up and walk out of what you're in because they walked out of their wilderness and into the land of promise. And this was a lot for Joshua, the leader. I mean, Moses has just died and it's like, okay, I got these millions of people. We're going to go in. We're not qualified for battle. We don't have, like, cool weapons. We don't have, like, sweet superheroes with us. It was a lot. And he was hanging on to the promises of God. Let me show you one of God's promises. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 3, God says, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. Now, this promise meant a lot to Joshua. He, he looks at the sole of his foot, and he says, everywhere I step, I will not be harmed. My family will not be harmed. I'm going to take some ground, and the enemies will not conquer us. Joshua took this to heart. Do you know how I know? I mean, he embraced this with everything in his being. I know this, and I want to show you why. I want to show you a picture. And it's not a picture of the moon. <laughs> this is an aerial photograph of the Judean desert. This is a photograph located just west of the Jordan River. This is the ancient camp that the Bible calls Gilgal. Right after the Israelites passed the Jordan River, they set up camp. They entered into the land and they set up camp. And do you notice, do you notice the shape of a footprint? That is the exterior walls of the camp that they set up with stones. It's still there today because it doesn't rain out there. So not much has been moved. Archaeologists have confirmed 100% this is Joshua's camp, 100% no doubt about it. They've even found bones of animals, all kosher. No unclean animals in this whole area. All this, they even had a place designated for the tabernacle marked out. Here's the camp. So, so what, what does this mean? A footprint, why would Joshua do this? this? This says something about Joshua's heart, doesn't it? This is awesome to me. It, it, it speaks, we're taking this. You're telling me the sole of my foot We'll take the land and my family won't be harmed. Then the whole camp of Israel is going to be shaped like a foot. So wherever they went, they set up their camp and marked it out. God is taking this land. And he's marching in. And there's just such a great boldness about this. And this is how God wants you to attack his promises. To not waver. But to just be like, bam, we are doing this. No doubt about it.
That's the kind of confidence he wants. So to me, it's just really sweet. All right, verse 11. It says, <clears throat> excuse me, it says, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Everyone say diligent. It kind of seems like an oxymoron because it's like, okay, work hard at resting? That's what God's saying. Work hard at resting. You know why that's so hard? One of the hardest orders from a doctor is when he says, go home and do nothing for like two, two or three weeks. It's like, I don't know about you ladies because you get more stuff done than us, but as a man, like for the first three days, that's sweet because we get to catch up on all our superhero movies and it's like, baby, we rub my feet and ladies, you're so compassionate and you're babying us. We get all the right food we want. We're not working. But after three, four days, it gets old, you know, like, okay, my mancation is over and stuff needs to be done and I can't sit here anymore. I'm going to go crazy. It takes a lot of work to rest. It reminds me of when you go repelling for the first time. Do you remember that? Who of you like really flipped out, freaked out the first time you went repelling? You're like, yeah, there's no shame in my game. Well, some people do. And it's like, because when you go off the ledge or whatever, you, you have to go straight back like towards your seeming death. And there's just this little rope and you have to go back and you got to trust the rope. And for some people, they really got to work hard at relaxing. Because the more you squirm and, and everything, you just get yourself in all these bad places and it's not comfortable at all, especially for a guy. And you, you're hanging by all the wrong places and it's just not fun, you know? You just got to go back and you got to work at resting. And so in life, God's saying, you got to work at this and don't freak out. The stakes are high. Because if not, it says, our fall will be similar to how the Israelites fell off in the wilderness. That's strong. That's pretty intense. There's such a, because it's so great, there's such a stern warning about not getting it done. Now, diligent. Okay, what, what, what does that really mean? Because we, we could think it means a lot of stuff. What does being diligent to enter God's rest look like specifically? Well, we just continue into the text. Look at verse 12. You know this verse. For the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now this is one of the more popular passages of the New Testament and it's great, but this is how it was written in context. Guys, it's clear, God wants you to be diligent to labor and enter into God's word because it takes work to read the Bible because as soon as it starts whispering, read me, you get all this spiritual warfare and everything in your flesh wants to do the opposite. I'm going to watch TV or I'm going to do anything. Anything but not read this book. You got to be diligent to enter into the Bible because it says the word of God is living and powerful because Jesus is the word of God and he's living and powerful. Amen? Revelation chapter 19, 13 tells us Jesus' name is the word of God and there is no other book that is living. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Notice the word inspiration. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. This Greek word is the word theonoustos. It's a compound word. Theos is the Greek word for God. Noustos is the Greek word that means breathe out, like, like your out breath. Theonoustos means, and in its context, the Bible is God's literal out breath. Now there's three times in scripture God breathed outwardly and all three times, something really miraculous happened. The first time God breathed out, he breathed on some pieces of dust, and it formed into a living, breathing man. That's a powerful breath. Another time, Jesus breathed on his disciples, 
And their dead hearts became alive and they were the first born again regenerated people ever. And God is also saying with that same power, he has breathed the word of God into existence and it has the power to change your life. It literally reshapes you if you let it. It's described here as being a two-edged sword, the Bible. So it cuts on both sides. And the Bible, it is full of contrasts between one thing and another, and maybe these contrasts speak of this two-edged sword. Like, you have the old covenant and the new covenant. You have God's law, but you also have God's grace. You have God's judgment and his salvation. You have his wrath, but you also have his reward. It says it's able to divide the soul and spirit. The soul are your thoughts. Your thought life is your soul. Your spirit is the intents of your heart. And it's saying the Bible is so powerful, it gets down into you like nothing or nobody on this planet can. It's a discerner, which means it exposes and reveals the truth about what's inside of us. It kind of works like a mirror, you know? Whether you like what you see or not, it's going to always tell you the truth. <laughs> and sometimes you love your mirror, and sometimes you hate your mirror. You hate your mirror when you got like three zits, and you're like, oh, no, I hate you. But then other times you're like, oh, you're showing me I got this thing in my teeth so I can get it out, so now I don't go downstairs and look like an idiot. And sometimes with the Bible, you read, and it's like, oh, that was so good. And other times you're like, oh, I hate it because you're showing me who I really am and it's uglier than I thought. The Bible will discern and then tell you why you really do what you do. Why you really think the way you do. We're so clever at covering our true intentions. We can fake everyone else in the house out about it. And we're so good we can deceive our own minds about things. And the Bible will be your greatest friend to keep you from being deceived by yourself or by somebody else. It's the heart-searching word of God. It pierces deep. And when it hits you, one side of the blade confronts you and it cuts into you to expose you. But then the other side of the blade takes out the junk and it only wounds so that it can heal. So as long as you allow the Bible to cut into you, it will literally alter and reshape your whole life. That's why it's like we don't fill our time up with all sorts of topical studies giving pep talks to people because that's not ultimately what's going to change you. We could do a 10-week series on how to be um, a better employee. But if you just go through the Bible verse by verse, that's what's going to change you, and ultimately, that's how you're going to be a better employee. Does that make sense? You guys know the difference between topical, fluffy pep talks and solid, steady Bible studies. You know the difference, and you know how it changes you differently. You know how it builds you up differently. And so, as we go through the Bible, this is why we do what we do. It's the greatest chance for marriages to be healthy, for every area of your life to be affected, you just got to let the Bible cut you and get into you. And it'll do its thing. It'll do its thing. When my son Gage was born with a heart defect two years ago and needed major open heart surgery in order to live, man, that was a trip. I learned then that every surgeon with a knife cuts because he intends to heal. And my son did have to be cut and injured in order to be healed permanently. That permanent scar that runs down his chest, that's, that's what allows him to be alive today. So I'm thankful for the surgeon and for his knife. It's scary but I'm thankful for it. Do you understand what that means for you spiritually? The reason why God's word cuts and wounds is because our hearts need to be healed. 
I mean, can we just, we can all come to this honest place where it's like, I'm a little jacked up, you're a little jacked up, we're all a little weird, right? That's not offensive, right? We all need reshaped because sin has damaged us, sin has affected us, and made us a little kooky in areas, and the Bible is what conforms us back into the image of God, which is healthy. And so God's wounds are always meant to heal things in your life. But here's the thing. You usually can't see it. He wounds you and you're like, what is happening? Those times you're frustrated. Why God? Why this? Are you serious? I'm so frustrated. I don't get this right now. Or it happened before. Why is it happening again? And God says, I see what you can't see. I see into you. Do you realize that? My only intention, I promise you, is your eternal benefit. That's the only reason why I'm going to puncture you with this knife. It's because you don't see what's in there, but I do. And if I don't do this, I see what's going to happen a year down the road. I see what's going to happen 15 years later down the road. I'm your savior. I'm your doctor. And guys, I'm no cardiologist. (laughs) God is. And I have to trust him in his area of expertise, just like I trust my son's cardiologist for his life. Does that make sense? Everyone say yes if it makes sense. Okay. Just deep in thought, I guess. <laughs> One last verse, guys. Verse 13. There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Now, this verse kind of seems like it's a stray, wandering verse, but it's not. It's connected to verse 12. It's like God saying, okay, you're going to be judged in the end by me anyways. Why not let the Bible start judging you now so you can change and be shaped into what I want so that when you do stand before me, you'll be a lot better off. Does that make sense? Whether or not you want to be honest about yourself and your life and whether or not you want to face reality, God still sees and knows everything about you and he's going to judge you. So it's going to be a lot more pleasant of an experience if we allow him to show us these things now rather than just being naive and waiting till after we die. Why try to shut yourself from his all-seeing eyes? So don't be scared to let God's word show you what's wrong with you. Because the light that you let in that exposes you and shows you what you're really like, guys, it's the same light that will lead you out into freedom and victory and into just being a way better person, a way better husband, wife, parent, kid, whatever. Let the word pierce and do its work. That's what he's calling you to be diligent into, and that is what you can do to assure yourself to enter into God's rest and not a life of complicated striving. And then guys, quickly, I want to read verses 14 through 16. I will break this down next week, but I I just want you to get it all. I want you to see what this is ultimately leading to because this is awesome. Verse 15, or 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Well, check, I always need mercy, I always need grace, so I can come to his throne boldly. Do you understand? This is where it's ultimately leading us too. The Sabbath rest of God is in the Holy of Holies where Jesus is seated on the throne. Guys, heaven is not just a place. It's a state of existence. What makes heaven heaven is that God's there. If God's not there, it'd be dumb. Heaven is a life. It's a, it's a state of being. It's a life where God's own presence and personal rest is felt and experienced. Jesus 
is our Sabbath. Amen? He even said, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is our rest, available to us every single day. That by faith, we can enter into the finished work of Christ again and not let ourselves or the enemy or anyone else put this trip on us that we got to do more. We got to do more. We got to work for it. We got to earn it. You just rest. And in that place of rest, you see your life take off and God's Spirit enabling you, empowering you, blessing you, opening doors for you that He wants and shutting those that He doesn't. And ultimately, at the end of your life, you do this daily, you will by far outdo whatever you could do on your own.